At the University of Pretoria, our UP way of life calls us to a greater purpose, a calling that cannot be imitated. It is an ethos we embrace and it exists in the hearts and minds of our staff, students and alumni. This ethos is what makes us different. This is what makes us a future-focused leading African global university where we make today matter. Our teaching and learning approach fosters critical thinking. We encourage each of our students to find their own voice and passion. Our hybrid learning model has transcended boundaries, creating opportunities for new generations and providing equal and equitable access to tertiary education. We continue to innovate through our advanced research platforms. Our focus on research beyond traditional academic disciplines integrates resources and sustainable practices across various departments and faculties to create African solutions for global problems. In doing so, we make an impact on society by empowering our communities and promoting sustainable development to transform lives and society. It is through responsible leadership and inclusivity that we produce graduates who are kind and embody strong values ethical principles and respect humanity. Our graduates are ready for the world beyond university and strive to reach their goals with tenacity and passion. Our graduates live a life they're proud of. Choose the UP way. Be part of how we teach, learn, innovate, impact and live. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to our audience who join us from different time zones in the world. I'm Vasu Reddy, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Pretoria. I will be your program director for the 27th University of Pretoria expert lecture to be presented by Professor Thad Metz, who's based in the Department of Philosophy. It is now my privilege to introduce the Vice-Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawane Kupe, who was appointed in January 2019. Professor Kupe holds a BA Honours Degree and a Master's in English from the University of Zimbabwe, as well as a DPhil in Media Studies from the University of Oslo in Norway. In December 2019, he was awarded an Honorary Doctorate in Humanities by Michigan State University. Prof. Kupe was the founding head of the Media Studies Department at Wits University. He's also an active member of several civil society organizations in the media space, including chairman of the board of Amabungane Center for Investigative Journalism since 2009, and since 2005, he has been chairman of the board of Media Monitoring Africa. It is my honor to invite Prof. Kupe to officially welcome you and introduce our speaker. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all who are joining this virtual UP Expert Lecture Series from wherever you are. We warmly welcome you. A few words about the UP Expert Lecture Series. It is an event that we hold at least twice a year, wherein I choose one of our many experts to share with the public their expertise in a particular area and in a particular domain. We're a public engaged university, so sharing expertise which improves society directly or and indirectly is something we cherish uh, doing. And so welcome to this sharing exercise today. And let me 
now introduce the expert who's giving the lecture today. We will have a second one uh, later uh, this year. Professor Thaddeus Metz received his PhD in philosophy from Cornell University in 1997. He first visited South Africa in 1999 and relocated here in 2004, initially lecturing at the University of the Witwatersrand as associate and then full professor from 2004 to 2008, and later at the University of Johannesburg as professor, research focus, and distinguished professor 2009 to 2020. He joined the University of Pretoria in 2020. Professor Messes around 300 scholarly books, chapters, and articles accepted for publication and published. Many of them take an analytic approach to African morality, the meaning of life, the nature of mental health, the point of a university, the role of a legal system, and a range of other topics in value theory, ethics, and political philosophy. Professor May's latest books include What Makes a Life Meaningful? a debate which is, uh, which is uh, forthcoming and will be published by Routledge, a relational moral theory, African ethics in and beyond the continent, published by Oxford University Press 2021, and God, Soul and the Meaning of Life, published by Cambridge University Press 2019. More than 50 of Professor May's essays have been reprint reprinted, sometimes translations into 10 different languages, most often Chinese, German, Igbo, and Persian. In recent recognition, Professor Metz has been designated as one of the world's top 50 thinkers by Prospect Magazine in 2020, and was awarded an A rating for the third time from the South African National Research Foundation in 2019. A fun fact includes Professor Metz once being mentioned as a clue on the nationally televised American game show Jeopardy. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry written by Thaddeus Metz, our expert today, or a movie co written by John Cleese was the answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? Ladies and gentlemen, and Professor Metz, your audience tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Coupe, for that introduction. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be giving this expert lecture. I appreciate the platform. Um, I'm a philosopher, and so tonight we're going to do some philosophy together. Um, but I've got a varied audience. On the one hand, I've got professional philosophers uh, listening to me this evening um, uh, that I want to achieve in my talk this evening. Uh, first, I want to expound a moral theory that's informed by uh, beliefs and practices associated with uh, the African ethic of Ubuntu. Ubuntu uh, literally means humanness in the Nguni languages of Southern Africa, uh, and it's often used to summarize the moral core of how we ought to live and treat one another. Uh, the second thing I want to do is apply uh, my interpretation of Ubuntu as a moral theory to a variety of ethical issues, uh, uh, it's going to range from interpersonal matters to institutional ones. Uh, we're going to think about uh, uh, ethics in the context of medicine on the one hand and education on the other. I want to cover an array of uh, different uh, kinds of topics this evening. And the third goal I've got is to argue that uh, the principled interpretation of African morality that I'm going to provide is attractive uh, uh, and that it's often preferable to principles that have been dominant, uh, uh, particularly in Western philosophy. In expounding an interpretation of Ubuntu or the African ethical tradition, my goal is not to represent uh, the way Ubuntu has been understood by African philosophers or African peoples. Uh, it's not to recount in an accurate way what others have thought about ethics. Rather, what I do is I draw selectively um, on appealing facets of African thought about morality to construct a moral theory or a basic principle. And I've defined what that is on this slide. 
Uh, here are three different ways to understand what a moral theory is. Uh, it can be understood as a comprehensive account of right as opposed to wrong actions, a specification of what all immoral actions have in common, and a reduction of all our various duties down to one foundational duty. Why might we be interested in a moral theory? Why interpret Ubuntu this way as opposed to some other way? There are two main reasons that have motivated me uh, to uh, uh, take on this project. Uh, first is philosophers love philosophy. Uh, we like philosophy for its own sake. Um, and uh, the kind of knowledge we would acquire if we had a justified basic moral principle would be interesting intellectually. It would be the philosophical equivalent of a scientific law. So take, for example, uh, E equals MC squared, where every single instance of energy that you encounter in the world is identified as mass traveling at a certain high rate of speed. If we had a well-founded basic principle, uh, uh, we'd have something similar in form to that, right? Every instance of a wrong action that you encounter would have a certain property that's yet to be specified. So that's a theoretical uh, aim uh, in undertaking a moral theoretic interpretation of, of Ubuntu. But for those who are more pragmatic uh, and want something practical, um, that is also on offer this evening. If we had a well-founded moral theory that were justified by claims that are relatively uncontroversial in respect of right and wrong, uh, then we could take that principle and use it to resolve more controversial issues. So uh, there's still quite a lot of debate about uh, abortion and the death penalty, for example. If we had a well-founded moral theory, we could uh, address those, particularly, again, if it were justified by claims that were much less controversial. So to put some flesh on the bones of the project, I've made a list of actions that I think are relatively uncontroversial, and I'm expecting that a very large majority of people in the audience this evening are going to agree that these actions are typically wrong. Uh, I suppose, uh, going in, that things like killing innocent people for money without their consent is immoral, that uh, promising to pay back a loan that one has no intention of paying back is, is also wrong, being cruel to animals for fun should not be done. Engaging in sexual assault, absolutely not. Using public funds for private purposes is immoral, unjust. Paying somebody less than a living wage when one could easily afford to pay a living wage seems wrong to me. Never giving to charity, never volunteering one's labor for others is wrong. Prohibiting women from working outside the home, throwing bricks at passing motorists as a form of protest, using racial epithets and similar slurs, enforcing segregationist policies in housing, and overthrowing a democratically elected government. All these two seem wrong to me, and I'm presuming that they seem wrong to you. My suggestion isn't that these are always or necessarily immoral. Uh, in particular, that last one, uh, as I recall, uh, Adolf Hitler was democratically elected. I wouldn't have minded if that particular government had been overthrown. The point is um, uh, that uh, these kinds of actions are generally, they're often wrong. Um, and uh, we can add to the list. This is just a partial list. If we had more time, we could expand it into something quite uh, substantial. Um, and that shows that uh, many of us inquiring into the difference between right and wrong share a common ground. Uh, uh, there are some judgments about morality that are relatively uncontested. Here now is what I think is a fascinating question. What might all those things on the previous list and every other action that seems wrong, what might they all have in common? Uh, uh, an answer to that question is a moral theory or a basic moral principle. Uh, in the history of Western philosophy, there have been two major moral theories or two major ways of answering this question about what all wrong actions might have in common as distinct from right ones. On the one hand, we have the utilitarian answer. So uh, 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 
roughly the idea is that the actions on that list, the relatively uncontroversial actions, um, uh, uh, one thing they seem to have in common is that they involve harm to other people and perhaps animals as well. At the very least, those actions don't seem to be doing anyone much good. And for the utilitarian, a good life is a happy life, that is, one filled with pleasure or satisfied desires. An unhappy life is one filled with a lot of pain or frustration. Uh, this theory has been around for some 250 years, longer actually. Uh, it was really uh, solidified in the work of Jeremy Bentham uh, in 1780. Notice the word utilitarian is appropriate because if something has utility, that means it's useful. And so from a utilitarian perspective, what makes actions right is that they're useful. Uh, they're good for improving people's quality of life, understood subjectively as a matter of pleasure or desire satisfaction in particular. Wrong actions are going to be those that fail to do that. But there's been another popular answer about what all those actions that seem wrong might have in common, and that's from the Kantian tradition, named after the German Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant. According to him, uh, the problem with those actions isn't that they reduce people's quality of life in the long run, in the aggregate. It's rather uh, that in the here and now, uh, they treat an individual's capacity to reason or live autonomously in a disrespectful way. So another uh, way of understanding what was wrong with those actions on the previous list is that they involve some kind of constraint on a person's choice. It involves coercion or deception or exploitation, and it's that manipulation of our intelligence and our rationality that makes those actions wrong, according to the Kantian. That theory, too, has been around a long time, at least since 1785. Those theories have been around since the late 18th century, but the project of seeking a moral theory that's well-grounded has been around for even longer, uh, at least since 1651, with the publication of Hobbes' uh, book, Leviathan. That's almost 400 years that Western philosophers have been putting their minds uh, to coming up with a basic moral principle that looks convincing. And I'm here to report uh, that there's no consensus uh, as yet. About a quarter to a third of philosophers are utilitarians or something like it. Another quarter or a third are Kantians or something close. And then we have, of course, those haven't been the only two moral theories over the past 400 years. Uh, and so we find uh, some folks that, that go in the other category. All the Western moral theories face serious exceptions or counterexamples, as we call them in philosophy. And then another fact, uh, and one that might well explain the absence of convergence amongst philosophical experts on a favored moral theory, might be that the resources that Western philosophers have drawn upon have been limited, limited to the Western tradition. It's a fact that moral theorists have not systematically engaged with non-Western cultures such as the African, and on the face of it, uh, that's foolish. That's a bad idea. Uh, we have reason to think going in that any long-standing culture or intellectual tradition probably has some insight into the human condition. And if that's true, then we ought not respect, restrict our intellectual resources to one tradition such as the Western. We should rather open things up. And so I'm led to the question at the bottom of this slide, how might we draw on indigenous African thought to construct a moral theory, and what would it look like? Would it be attractive? Would it give the utilitarian and Kantian theories a run for their money? That's the project I've been working on for about the past decade. Here I tell you a bit about my findings. If you look at existing work on African morality, there are principled interpretations. And what you will often find are maxims like, a person is a person through other persons, or I am because we are. Um, uh, 
those are accurate translations of the indigenous uh, languages, so far as I can tell. Um, but despite being accurate, they're not very helpful. If you're not already au fait with sub-Saharan cultures and ways of life, you're not going to know what it means to say a person is a person through other persons. Uh, uh, we need, uh, I think, an interpretation of the ethic that wears more of its moral meaning on its sleeve, is more readily accessible to those outside the fold. And so uh, uh, one way that I've interpreted uh, Ubuntu uh, as a moral theory, that is African ideas about ethics in the form of a basic principle, is the following. I've suggested that one should become a real person uh, by respecting others' capacity to relate harmoniously. So that part of what's going on when it's said that a person is a person is not a tautology, uh, it's rather a prescription. One is being uh, uh, enjoined, uh, uh, it's being suggested to you that you develop your personhood, that you live a genuinely human way of life, uh, literally, that you exhibit Ubuntu. And the way to do that characteristically for the African tradition is to relate to others in a particular way, and in particular, uh, more specifically, talk of harmony is prominent in the field. Another way that I interpret the tradition at times is not in terms of personhood or virtue, but rather wrongness. Uh, so I say, an act is wrong if and only if it fails to honor those that can commune or be communed with. I'm going to prefer uh, this rendition because it gives us a nice comparison with the utilitarian and Kantian principles that I uh, sketched earlier. I think these uh, principled interpretations say more than merely a person is a person through other persons, but there are some technical terms here I need to define. I need to tell you what I mean by a harmonious relationship or what it means to commune or be communed with. To get started on that, I'm going to draw on uh, some remarks from South African intellectuals about how we should relate to each other. First off is a comment from Justice Makoro, who is uh, on South Africa's constitutional court and appealed to the ethic of Ubuntu in some of her rulings, most famously in uh, her and the court's judgment uh, that the death penalty is unconstitutional. She remarks of what it is to be part of a harmonious relationship this way. She says, harmony is achieved through close and sympathetic social relations within the group. Next, we also have a remark from Archbishop Tutu, of course, chair of the South Africa's Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission. He thought uh, that Ubuntu made good sense of the TR seeds functioning. Um, I agree that it supports some kind of reconciliation, although we might disagree about whether it supports the, the specific one of the TRC. In any event, Tutu is a reliable source when it comes to the nature of Ubuntu, and he says this, hey, he or she has Ubuntu. This means they are generous, hospitable, friendly, caring, and compassionate. It also means I am human because I belong. Social harmony is for us, and he's speaking of indigenous Africans here, the summum bonum, the greatest good. Finally, we have some comments from Professor Nkondo, who was uh, uh, a member of South Africa's National Heritage Council, which is tasked with protecting the tangible and intangible heritage of South Africa, where the intangible includes the philosophy and the values of its people. He says, if you ask Ubuntu advocates and philosophers what the principles are that inform and organize their lives, the answers would express a commitment to the good of the community and a need to experience their lives as bound up with the community. Now, I've colored uh, uh, some of the words in these quotations, um, and that's to highlight that I think harmony or uh, relating communally involve two distinct relationships, two distinct ways of interacting. On the one hand, we have the material in green that talks of sympathy, generosity, hospitality, uh, friendliness, care, compassion, and a commitment to the good of the community. That seems to have to do with well-being or people's quality of life. On the other hand, we have the words in blue or teal, uh, which talk about being close, belonging, experiencing one's life as bound up with the community. That has more to do with identity or agency. So one thing I've done in my work is split these different ways of relating into two, uh, giving them fairly precise definitions, showing that they each have their different logic, but that they're nonetheless quite attractive 
when we put them together. So I need to give you some definitions now of what it is to be capable of a communal or harmonious relationship. On the one hand, we have uh, identifying with other people or sharing a way of life with them. That includes a psychological component of enjoying a sense of togetherness. So if you identify with other persons, part of what is involved in that is thinking of yourself as a we, a member of a group or part of a relationship, not so much an I who's distanced from others. Another part of enjoying a sense of togetherness is taking pride in the accomplishments of other people and feeling bad uh, when they fail. On the other hand, identifying with others also includes a behavioral component of, of coordinating or cooperating. It involves participating and on an even-handed basis, on the basis of trust and transparency and voluntariness, as opposed to some kind of subordination. That's part of a communal relationship. The other part is exhibiting solidarity with others or caring for their quality of life. In the first instance, behaviorally, that's a matter of aiding other people, going out of one's way to help them, and in particular by meeting their needs and helping them commune with still other people. Another element of solidarity is psychological, and that's a matter of sympathizing with others and helping them for their sake, not for one's own sake in the long term. I've distinguished these two facets of a communal relationship. I do think they're different. You can have one without the other. I think uh, an example of identity without solidarity might be students in my classroom. Uh, I think we probably do share a sense of togetherness. We have a sense of we as a members of the course after some weeks anyway. And we do cooperate with each other and participate with the, the joint aim of learning something together. But I doubt that my students come to class uh, for my sake. Um, I doubt that students come to class in order to help me and meet my needs or, or enable me to commune still better. Um, uh, it would be nice if they did, but I don't think that's the case. Conversely, I think we can have solidarity without identity. So when I give anonymously to charity, uh, I'm doing what I expect will meet people's needs, uh, 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 and I'm doing it for their sake and often out of sympathy. But if I do it anonymously, it's hard to say that we enjoy a sense of togetherness or that I'm coordinating uh, in a joint project in any rich sense. So these are two different ways to relate. But what's powerful when we put the two together is that uh, uh, the combination of identity and solidarity is more or less what English speakers mean by friendliness or a very broad sense of love. And so what I see at the heart of the African tradition is the idea that if you want to know the difference between right and wrong, uh, you should think carefully about how family members and friends interact with one another. I want to say a little bit more about the African credentials of this communal relation. Um, uh, I think it makes good sense of an array of salient features of indigenous African cultures and philosophies and ways of life. I'm not going to go through all of this list, but I'll mention two. Um, it was, has been typical of indigenous African societies to resolve conflict by appeal to consensus. So often enough, if there was a, a, a some kind of conflict um, or decision that needed to be made, uh, everyone would sit under the proverbial tree until a solution was found that everyone could sign onto. Consensus was often taken to be a necessary condition of a just way of going forward. I think what explains the drive for consensus well is communal relationship as the combination of identity and solidarity. Uh, if you have consensus, then you don't have, for example, a split between a majority and a minority, where the minority is going to feel left out. It won't enjoy a sense of togetherness with the majority. An extremely intense form of cooperation or coordination would be everybody signing on to the project in the form of consensus. For another example of a characteristically sub-Saharan practice that I think communal relation uh, well explains, uh, consider cons collective labor. Again, it's been common in indigenous African societies for people or different families to have their own plots, but they wouldn't be held responsible for harvesting on their own plot. Instead, everybody would gather together and move from plot to plot to help one another harvest. 
Here again, I think the themes of enjoying a sense of togetherness, of cooperating, of mutual aid, and helping one another uh, for one another's sake are prominent. Um, I think the other uh, uh, salient features of African societies are also well explained by this communal relation, but uh, I'm going to leave that for now. I'm less interested in, in showing the African credentials of the ethic that I articulate uh, than I am at applying it to some ethical issues and particularly uh, weighing it up against the Western theories. To do that, I need three corollaries. Right? I need three uh, 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 principles that come out of that basic obligation to respect others' capacity to be party to communal or harmonious relationships. Right? If that's what makes people special, if what gives them a dignity is their ability to relate in that communal manner, then I think the following uh, claims are true. I think generally we ought to avoid treating people discordantly. We ought to be, avoid treating people in the opposite way of on the basis of an us and them mentality of subordinating rather than coordinating, of harming as opposed to helping, and of uh, acting in a cruel or indifferent manner as opposed to a sympathetic and altruistic one. So generally speaking, uh, don't subordinate or harm an innocent person. Second corollary, when feasible, uh, go out of your way to relate communally, that is, exhibit identity and solidarity with other people, and particularly when you're seeking to help them, enable them to actualize their own capacity to relate communally. That's what gives them a dignity, after all. And finally, uh, I suggest that if we need to respect people in virtue of their communal capacity, we don't want to promote as much community as we can. Instead, if we've been in a long-standing and close tie with somebody, we've got some reason to maintain that tie and to enrich it, and in any event, to prioritize aid to members of that relationship before strangers. There are other corollaries of the ethic um, uh, that I will need to provide a, a more comprehensive application of it, so these won't enable me to address animal rights, for example, but they should be enough for my talk today. So if we get a big picture of our moral theories, uh, here they are. In slogan terms, according to the utilitarian, wrong acts are those that cause harm or fail to prevent harm, uh, or at least aren't, uh, don't promote benefit, happiness, as much as possible. The appeal to autonomy says wrong acts are those that degrade individual choice. Right acts, in contrast, treat a person's autonomy as having a dignity, the most important value, that we mustn't degrade with coercion or deception, for example. And then we get a different kind of answer by appeal to communal relationship. Wrong acts from this perspective are those that are discordant, that tend to separate people or put distance between them, where right acts, in contrast, are those that honor their ability to harmonize and be harmonized with, as I've defined a few slides ago. With that, I think we're able now to compare uh, this African moral theory with the more Western ones that have been uh, dominant in at least English-speaking philosophy for about 250 years. My goal isn't to show you that the Ubuntu, my interpretation of Ubuntu, is better than the Western principles. Uh, it's just to show you that it's a reasonable alternative. And I've got two sorts of comparisons I want to make to make that case. The first sort of comparison is one in which I think all three principles probably tell us to do the same thing in the final analysis. Right? They entail the same kinds of obligations. But there's an important difference, at least philosophically, in that uh, the explanations that these principles give as to why we ought to act one way rather than another are different. And I'm going to look uh, at the kinds of cases relevant to this comparison uh, involve poverty, informed consent, interracial relationships, and the allocation of employment. So for each of these uh, ethical issues, I'm going to start with what we philosophers call an intuition. And an intuition is uh, supposed to be a relatively uncontroversial judgment of what to do in a particular case or a particular scenario. And some of them will be hypothetical. This one is not. Uh, I think, and I, I'm hoping you agree, 
that it's an injustice for very wealthy nations and individuals not to help those who are poor due to factors beyond their control. I don't think it matters how the rich became rich, whether they stole their wealth on the one hand or whether they created it in a, in a particularly, you know, in a purely fair manner on the other. If somebody's got billions of dollars uh, and others have nothing to the point where their basic needs are not being met, it would be wrong for the rich not to help those poor. I think all three moral theories give us the same conclusion, that conclusion, but the explanations are different. The utilitarian says poverty is an injustice because the poor are suffering needlessly. It's the pain, it's the unhappiness of poverty that makes a moral claim on the rich. The friend of autonomy says, no, it isn't the unhappiness. It's rather that if you're poor, you're not able to make a wide array of decisions. You don't have much choice in your life. Your options are limited. We get a different kind of explanation of the injustice of poverty if we appeal to community or communality. From this perspective, at least part of what makes poverty an injustice is roughly that if you're poor, you have nothing to give to others. Uh, if you're poor, you're not in a position to be able to share in particular with children uh, 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 and parents and other loved ones. Uh, that's part of what I think plausibly makes poverty an injustice. It's the inability to relate. I think that's a compelling point. Uh, uh, that's certainly part of why we don't want to be poor, because we wouldn't be in a position to help our family members. And an appeal to Ubuntu highlights that dimension in a way that isn't highlighted by the utilitarian or autonomy-oriented theories. Second intuition. I'm going to move you now to a, a medical setting. And you are to imagine you're a medical professional, such as a nurse or a doctor. Um, and the suggestion is that if you're in that position, uh, you normally are morally required to get informed consent from a patient before you treat that individual. You need to inform her of what you propose to do, uh, give her the risks, uh, give her the benefits, talk about the alternatives open to her, uh, give her the opportunity to ask questions and the like. Again, our moral theories align in all prescribing informed consent as a default way that medical professionals uh, uh, should interact with patients. But again, the explanations are different, and I think interestingly so. For the utilitarian, if we don't provide informed consent, then the patient is uh, going to be less trusting of the physician, uh, for example, uh, down the road, and so is probably not going to adhere to regimen as much and is going to be less healthy and then less happy. The friend of autonomy says it's not the long-term consequences that matter uh, in terms of people's happiness. It's rather that if a treatment is imposed on somebody without getting permission, then that person isn't the author of her life. There's an infringement of self-governance. The appeal to communality gives us a different, a more relational explanation of why informed consent is normally appropriate. According to it, one important way of relating harmoniously or communally is to share a way of life, is to identify with one another. But that's not going to happen if you impose a treatment on the patient. You're going to be flouting the value of sharing a way of life if you don't base the interaction on transparency, on trust, and on voluntariness. That's a different kind of explanation about why informed consent is morally expected, um, and I think it rivals the utilitarian uh, and autonomy-based views. Here's a third intuition that I'm hoping you're going to share with me. That's that the state may not outlaw interracial rel romantic relationships because there's nothing immoral about them. Again, the three moral theories give us the same answer. The utilitarian roughly says, well, whatever makes them happy. They're not hurting anybody, and so they should be left alone. Uh, the Kantian, or the friend of autonomy, says, well, it's their choice. Uh, they're not preventing others from living as they see fit. And so again, the law has no business forbidding that kind of interaction. We get a different explanation by appeal to communality or harmonious relationship. 
From this perspective, the reason there's nothing immoral about interracial relationships is that love is the most intense form of harmonious relationship you can get. If we think about what's central to love, it just is a matter of uh, uh, enjoying a sense of togetherness, sharing a sense of self, uh, engaging in joint projects, doing what you can to make the other person better off, and doing it for the other person's sake, and often out of sympathy. Uh, 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 a loving interracial relationship is something to protect as opposed to forbid from this perspective. And a fourth example where I think all three moral theories tell us to do the same thing concerns how to allocate jobs. I'm presuming you're going to agree with me that it would be wrong, unjust, not to hire somebody to be a firefighter merely because she's a woman, at least if she were well qualified for the position. Right? The default position when uh, allocating jobs should be one of equal opportunity, which roughly means that jobs should go to those who are particularly well qualified them. And we set aside here issues such as uh, equity in hiring or what Amer Americans tend to call affirmative action. Set that aside. The utilitarian says it's appropriate to uh, give jobs to those qualified for them because that's going to best promote the general welfare. Just imagine if people routinely had jobs they weren't qualified for. A society would be much less happy, so the utilitarian suggests. The friend of autonomy gives a different explanation about why equal opportunity is justified. According to this perspective, um, uh, if we apportion jobs to qualifications, we give people more control over their lives. Right? Qualifications are a matter of a willingness to work hard or having taken advantage of public education to, to acquire qualifications. Those things are within people's control, whereas one's uh, uh, a biological sex or gender are much less within one's control. But the communal ethic gives us a different explanation of why equal opportunity should be the default mode for allocating jobs. According to this perspective, what makes people special is, in part, their ability to exhibit solidarity with others, that is, to help others. If the woman is particularly well qualified to be a firefighter and help people in that way, and she's passed over simply because she's a woman, then what is special about her, what gives her a dignity, her ability to help or care for others, is being degraded. It's not being treated as important. And I think there again, we get a different, uh, on the face of it, plausible account of the wrongness. In my last few slides, I want to make a second kind of comparison between uh, Ubuntu as a moral theory on the one hand and our Western moral theories on the other. Uh, uh, unlike the previous four cases, in these, I think the African ethic tells us to do something different than what is prescribed by the Western principles. And I think uh, uh, the different path recommended by Ubuntu is plausible. It's worth taking seriously as an alternative. And here I'm going to discuss punishment, education, uh, whom to rescue from death, and whom to help die. I'm hoping you're going to agree with my intuition at the top about how we ought to punish people in the ideal case. I think a just penalty is one that uh, consists of burdensome labor that will rehabilitate the offender and do the victim some good, compensate the victim. I think merely isolating people, for example, putting them in prison uh, or expelling them from a higher education institution, I think that's far from ideal. It's much better if the person is put to work in a way that's likely to affect reform uh, so that the person doesn't re-victimize anybody and that does some good for the victim. If you agree with that, then you're not, I think, going to like the utilitarian or Kantian theories. You're going to favor Ubuntu. For the utilitarian, the right penalty is whatever is going to prevent crime as much as possible, and that might well include deterring would-be offenders with threats, in particular threats of prison. For the Kantian, uh, uh, often a punishment should take the form of retribution. That is, we should uh, uh, roughly do to the offender what uh, uh, he did to his victim because he misused his rational capacities. And again, prison seems a live option as a way to inflict the deserved amount of harm. In contrast, for the communal ethic, what's important about people is their ability to relate. And so penalties should, uh, on the one hand, express disapproval when relationships are broken, 
but on the other, they ought to serve a productive purpose and serve the function of mending those relationships in some kind of broadly reconciliatory approach. That would have us, I think, uh, impose penalty penalties that are likely to rehabilitate the offender on the one hand and to compensate the victim on the other. Roughly, put the offender to work uh, and take the proceeds of his labor and give it to the victim. Here's another claim uh, that I'm hoping you're going to see the plausibility of or see, you know, uh, find uh, intuitive to some degree um, and which Ubuntu supports better than the Western accounts. I'm going to suppose that it's right for a university to prioritize the teaching of local cultures. That doesn't mean teach only local cultures, um, but it means to give the priority, uh, the lion's share of attention to them. So, for example, there would be something odd, I think, if we were in Japan and the bulk of what was taught in respect of film or literature or philosophy were about, you know, drew on uh, resources from Brazil. <laughs> uh, closer to home, if we're in Africa, then the bulk of cultural instructions should be in respect of African sources. It's hard for the utilitarian to make sense of that claim. According to that perspective, we ought to teach whichever culture is going to make students happiest on the face of it. That could be Hollywood. For the friend of autonomy, cultural instruction should enable rational evaluation of all the options. They should be told about the different aesthetic forms out in the world and enabled uh, to make up their own minds about which is best. In contrast, if we're friends of Ubuntu or communality, then part of the aim of instructing culture should be to foster a shared way of life, and hence, in part, to teach because this is who we are, uh, this is where we are, and we have an obligation to engage and enrich, and perhaps at times reinterpret, uh, the values uh, and other aspects of a local culture. Third case is now uh, uh, remove yourself from the educational setting, put yourself on a boat. Uh, imagine you've taken your uh, mother uh, for a cruise. Uh, she's unfortunately fallen off the side of the boat, um, as has a stranger. Um, uh, uh, there is unfortunately only one life preserver available to you, and you now have to decide uh, which person gets the life preserver. Does it go to your mother on the one hand, or does it go to the stranger on the other? I've got the intuition that if you're, uh, you have to choose, you can't save both, uh, you should pick your mom. However, it's difficult for the Western theories to make sense of that. For the utilitarian, I should save whichever person is going to make society happiest in the long run. Uh, doesn't look like that's necessarily going to be mama. Uh, my mama's in her late 70s. Uh, uh, she hasn't been working for a while. Uh, she's taking up quite a bit of uh, healthcare resources. Uh, I'm not sure from a utilitarian perspective that she would win. <laughs> Particularly, uh, that's going to be true if the other person, the stranger, is relatively young, uh, uh, healthy, uh, and is a doctor and going to do lots of good. The utilitarian would say, in that sort of scenario, I would be wrong to save my mother, and hence is unable to accommodate the intuition. For the friend of autonomy, I think the natural thing to say is that both uh, persons in the water uh, have, the, or have an equal dignity as rational beings. They both have a, a capacity to govern themselves, they both have an ability, a kind of intelligence that animals lack that makes them special. Um, and so long as I haven't promised my mother to have saved her, and I, let's presume I didn't, I brought her on the boat, I never thought about this scenario, uh, if we have two beings of an equal dignity, then I should randomize, it seems, from a Kantian perspective, that is, I should flip a coin. In contrast, if what's special about us are our ties, uh, and in particular, if I've shared a long-standing and intense communal relationship with my mom, then the communal ethic would say she is the one to be favored. Roughly speaking, family first, or charity begins at home. And here now is my last case that I want you to think about. Back in a medical setting, uh, you are now uh, a doctor, and you have a patient who's got an incurable uh, terminal illness and is in great pain. And we presume, for the sake of argument, as a hypothetical, that the only way to end the pain is to inject a dose of painkiller 
that would be so strong as to foreseeable and foreseeably end the person's life. My intuition is that, that in that specific case, uh, it's justified for the doctor to provide that degree of painkiller, uh, knowing that the foreseen result will be the death of the patient. I think the utilitarian and Kantian theories have difficulty making sense of that sort of case. Right? Uh, for the utilitarian, consent doesn't seem to matter in itself. All that matters ultimately is whether they're suffering or not. And so the logic of the utilitarian view suggests that it would be right for the doctor to uh, euthanize the person without her consent, even if she were mentally competent and able to understand what's going on. Uh, I think the friend of autonomy has the opposite problem. Uh, the friend of autonomy can say, no, consent is really important. We can't go around uh, uh, in, uh, uh, killing people, uh, particularly if they don't consent to it. But what's morally important for the Kantian is not something fundamental about people's quality of life. And the logic of the view seems to suggest that it would be permissible to kill people so long as we receive their consent, even if they lacked an incurable terminal illness and were in enormous pain. In contrast, an appeal to communality seems to give us the right answer. From this perspective, euthanasia would be justified only if, if it involves relating communally. That is, only if, if it involves cooperation, that is, roughly getting consent from the patient on the one hand, and if it involved aiding, that is, removing otherwise unavoidable great pain on the other. I haven't been completely fair to my colleagues. I warned them at the start of this talk. Um, uh, if we had more time, um, I would consider replies on behalf of utilitarians and Kantians to the criticisms I've made of their theories. Um, but in a way, I haven't needed to do that today because my goal hasn't been to argue that the principled interpretation of African morality that I've offered you today is better than the Western theories. Um, all I've really been out to show is that it's plausible, uh, that it's worth taking seriously, that the indigenous African tradition of thought about morality has something to offer a global audience. And so I think going forward, one conclusion I think we can fairly draw is that any plausible moral theorization must include insights from the indigenous African tradition. But if you liked this project, if you thought it was promising and interesting, then I want to leave you with one last big idea which uh, uh, is that uh, it should be expanded in a certain way. I suggested earlier that we've got reason to think that any long-standing intellectual tradition has insight into the human condition. If that's true, then we shouldn't look merely at Western intellectual resources or even African intellectual resources. We also need to look at, for example, East Asian Confucianism or South Asian Buddhism or South American Buen Vivir. These cultures, too, have been around for at least several hundred uh, years. Uh, and ideally, we would mind them for insights about how we might construct a basic moral principle. And this kind of project would drive us towards what I think would be a particularly promising global ethic. There are a few uh, of my publications where I say a bit more about this project. Uh, one is a relatively early paper when I first addressed uh, African morality in a moral theoretic way. Uh, second is a book of mine, A Relational Moral Theory, which isn't out yet but should be uh, in print by the end of this year. And then finally, there's a forthcoming paper uh, that gives you a glimpse of that kind of more global enterprise uh, that um, I think would be worth undertaking. There are references to uh, the quotations from uh, uh, Mokoro, Tutu, and Nkando. And then finally, if you'd like to get in touch with me for whatever reason to discuss things about this talk, uh, please do feel free to email me. I will write you back. Thank you very much for uh, attending uh, to this talk, and thank you very much uh, to uh, my vice chancellor and my dean for the platform. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Metz, for really a fascinating, illuminating lecture um, done in a Thad Metz style. Mm -hmm. uh, complex arguments, deep philosophy, but presented in an accessible way um, for a broad audience. And as is typical of any discourse that's presented uh, by a philosopher at that, 
it will generate discussion and debate. Yeah. And I'm glad that you've invited the audience to participate in that. Um, I think we have some questions that are emerging and some that have come through, and I think we'll take a couple, uh, some really interesting ones. Perhaps uh, maybe one that we could start with is a question that goes like this. Can wrong actions have consequences in the schema of harmonious existence with others? If so, what is the extent of correcting this wrong? Any responses to that? Let me see it again. Can wrong actions have consequences in the schema? So can wrong actions produce harmony, I think, is the, the question. And I do think uh, things that I would say are wrong could foster harmony. Um, uh, but what I would say is that um, I don't want an ethic that tells us to promote harmony as much as possible in the long run. I, I rather want an ethic that tells us to treat people as special in virtue of their ability to relate harmoniously. And what that means is that we need to pay attention to each particular individual and treat that person in a respectful manner. And so, uh, by and large, when we encounter an individual, we ought to treat that person in a cooperative way and in a way that's helpful, uh, even if the results would be unwelcome. Hmm. Indeed. Uh, here's another one. Uh, simply, can we develop Ubuntu further using the comparative exercise that Metz suggests in his talk? Look, uh, in this talk, I considered, what, eight uh, different uh, ethical situations. There are lots more out there. Um, and so I do think, you know, part of my project as a philosopher over the past decade has been considering uh, many more ethical scenarios uh, besides those eight, but I haven't covered everything. Uh, and so there is much more work to be done by colleagues as well if they like the project. Indeed, indeed. Um, here's an interesting one. If my personhood is tied to the recognition of other persons, what is the Ubuntu way of relating to person who thinks I'm subhuman? Hmm. I think that's a really good question, and I think it puts some pressure on the standard interpretation of Ubuntu and the standard understanding of African morality. So the standard view is that uh, to exhibit personhood, we need to relate to others in positive ways. But what this is pointing out is that if we do that in certain cases, uh, it's not going to be in our interests. Uh, it's going to be degrading or harmful to us. And so I do think that one modification that probably needs to be considered when uh, thinking about Ubuntu philosophically is whether we might not want a category of duties to ourself. Right? We want not merely to think that we can develop our personhood or, or exhibit genuine humanness by treating others well, but uh, my sense is that probably, if we're going to interpret Ubuntu attractively, we should also think that we can be genuine human beings by virtue of the way we treat ourselves. And that would mean uh, not engaging with somebody who thinks we're subhuman. Well, I suppose there's... Uh that's, a, that's an interesting way to, to, to end the conversation, but it doesn't end the conversation because that's precisely what your talk so richly uh, opened up for all of us, the audience out there, and certainly for us thinking about these things in much more deeper ways. And as you've invited people to please write you um, and, and engage you on these very important and topical issues, I want to thank you again for, for sharing in such an accessible way, such a rich set of insights with deep philosophy, complex issues that you've presented in a very layered way uh, to, to a broad range of people, but also more importantly, I think, relating it to real life situations mm -hmm. in a way that philosophy is grounded uh, and not necessarily diluting or simplifying uh, the deep issues that, that we need to think about more. Uh, more deeply. Thank you again for that and I would like to also thank the audience for joining us but more importantly the Vice-Chancellor Professor Cooper for inviting us and showcasing a senior scholar Professor Thad Metz in the Faculty of Humanities. We deeply appreciate that and to um, bring this event to a close I would like to invite the Vice-Chancellor and Principal Professor Cooper to make some closing comments.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I think you heard for ourselves our top expert in Ubuntu and philosophy more broadly. Thank you so much for attending this expert lecture. And we at the University of Pretoria will endeavor to bring you more expert lectures. Uh, Professor Thad Metz was one of our best, one of our top experts, but expect the next one, which is going to be Professor Margaret Chitiga Mabugo, our first and new black female dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences and an economist and a scholar in public service and the public administration. Again, thank you to Professor Thad Metz. Stimulating, wonderful. We expect more of you. And thank you, Professor Reddy. And thank you to everybody. A very good evening. Thank you and a very good afternoon and a very good morning to those having their morning coffee. Goodbye. We all see the same world, but research creates a new vision of what is and what is possible. Research is central to the University of Pretoria's vision. We strive to expand the boundaries of knowledge, to develop thought leaders, to answer global questions and to create an impact that can change lives. A combination of high productivity and excellence has earned UP an international reputation for research that is a game changer for Africa and the entire 21st century world. What we do will shape the future. The University of Pretoria's diverse research platforms offer a launchpad for today's generation of knowledge seekers. Unlocking tomorrow's potential in the unknowns of today. Our research themes and priorities pave the way to a more sustainable and equitable future for Africa and the world. Covering topics from food security to astrophysics, health and well-being to new business, and from biodiversity to education in the digital era. Engineering 4.0 is a platform of synergy for the development of smart transportation networks where digital technologies and augmented intelligence will enable new communication networks and urban development. The ever-evolving art of Africa has found a new home at the Javits UP Art Centre, where the deep histories and cultures of African people combine with technology to inspire new creativity. Recognising that knowledge cannot be compartmentalised, UP champions a transdisciplinary approach. Creating Future Africa, a hub, a community, a home for African scholars and a meeting place. A place where digital connectivity enables minds to meet without boundaries and shared knowledge enables new solutions to African challenges. Welcome to the University of Pretoria, where we do research that matters.